the Spotlight. I'm your host, Jack Ellis. So good to be with you again this week and glad to have you with us here on the Middle Georgia Spotlight. Uh, my first show this year, so I, even though we're well into the year, let's still like to wish everyone a happy new year. And I'd like to thank Mr. Ron Wildman for sitting in for me during my absence for the last two, three months, I think it was. And we appreciate him and what he brings to the table, literally brings to the table when I'm not here. Today we're very fortunate to have as I guess. Uh, he's a very busy man. We all know him, and um, we appreciate him. And there's none other than the superintendent of our schools, Dr. Curtis Jones. Thank you so much, Dr. Jane with us. Today. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Well, first of all, I don't know whether we should say congratulations or we should all be crying that you have decided to move on to retire, not to move on to another job, but to go into retirement, which you uh, deservedly earned. So. Tell us a little bit about that decision. I'm very excited. Uh, when I came back in 2015, I thought I would be here for about three to five years, and it's going to turn out to be seven. So that's almost twice as long as I thought it would be, but it's now time to finish the strategic plan we put in place and let someone else come in with a new vision, work with the board that we have, and move forward. And my wife and I have been married, oh, man. 45 years. What? So you look like you're no more than 45 years old. So it's now time for us to uh, celebrate that. We have grandkids and looking forward to spending more time with them. And people should know that this was a second career, maybe even a third career for you. You retired Army Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel from the Army, and then worked in education elsewhere before you came here. So this is not your first rodeo, so to speak. So very happy, and Mom's still around as well. Mom is 91, and so I'm going to spend more time with her as well. Well, of course, Doc, we uh, appreciate your leadership in more ways than one before the pandemic, but more especially during the pandemic. And I speak not only from a citizen, but also from a parent that had a child in the school system and getting through this pandemic. And we're still in it, so to speak. But how has that changed you and your leadership style and the people that, when I say how it changed you, you all had to do a lot of things, build a plane as it was flying, so to speak. I think what the pandemic did for us is made us recognize what's most important. We spent a lot of time having conversations about some things that just really weren't that important. Uh, but the pandemic, one, put the focus on people, keeping them safe, making sure you had relationships, trying to get students into school so they could learn, and then being focused on having those relationships. Um, I think the, I, I am thankful for having that new perspective. I think the other thing that's changed for me is I've realized how much politics really does play in a school. We talk a lot about how cultural wars, wars on the outside come into school and they make us fight them out. We're trying to decide when to wear a mask, when not to wear a mask, if students are going to be in school or if they're going to be out virtual. Um, we tried our best to follow the science, but sometimes people said, no, that's just a political side that you have. And, um, and so I came to have a better appreciation for that as well. You know, I was going to ask you, was because you had to look out for the safety and welfare of all of these students, the teachers, the bus drivers, everyone, you had to look out for their, 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 their welfare and their safety. So how did, what, you came down on the, on the science or listening to parents who were showing up and said, my kids are not going to wear a mask. You were strictly on the science. You stayed with we that. We did our best to listen to what the experts said about science. So we listened to the CDC. We listened to the White House uh, Coronavirus Task Force. We looked at what the middle Georgia, uh, north central Georgia health district said, and we tried to put all that together to figure out what was best for us uh, because it was important to know what's going on here. And uh, I'm very thankful that the Board of Education allowed us to do that. Uh, they were very supportive of the efforts. They did not bring into it their own individual desires. They said, you have more information than we do for the most part. We're thankful you're sharing it with us. We understand what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, early on, you were, cause I had you, I was fortunate enough to have you on the show when this pandemic first started, and you were concerned about the loss of learning, especially mm -hmm. those children who were already challenged and, and, and you know, disadvantaged or what have you. And has that panned out? Have they been able to thus far? Is that, or is this a, a marathon that's going to take a it's, while for them to get there? It's going to be a marathon because what you have to recognize is it's been going on now for two and a half years. And so students who are in first grade are now in third grade. And we want them to be able to leave reading on grade level. 
it was already difficult before the pandemic, and so now we're going to have to deal with that even more. I will tell you, though, that our teachers have figured out how to uh, assess students better and be able to give them more individualized instruction. One of the changes that we made was to go to personalized learning. You know, I'm not going to say we did one size fits all, but what we are now able to do is look at you, see where you are, and then tailor programs specifically for you. And we may put you in a small group with other kids who are similar but not exactly the same. And the group of teachers we have now have been trained in how to help you grow to be all you can be. And so I'm very thankful for that. So we have really come out of this in a better way than when we went into it. So you're confident that the children who were challenged, maybe they didn't have the right technology or didn't have parents at home to have, that we can make that up, but it's going to take some time. I think it's going to take some time. If you look at our graduation rate for the class of 2020, it dipped. The first time in my 25 years in education, our graduating class graduation rate dipped. That was symbolic of what happened over the school district as a whole. But for the class of 2021, we returned above that level. And I'm confident that as long as the uh, teachers are allowed to continue the process they have, and as long as teachers, not teachers, parents, have students come to school, we'll be okay. I do need help. The attendance is not where it was. We used to have an average daily attendance rate of about 98%. It's now down to 91, 92. Some people have gotten this idea that it's okay to stay home more than when you're just sick. Um, in some cases, it was because they want to be careful about coronavirus, but I'm just going to ask that next year, send your students to school. we got to get back to an attendance rate in the high 90s mm -hmm. uh, because without students being in class with teachers, we can't do what we need to do to help them uh, learn more. Now, the college level, can you prepare children to go on to work for whatever they're going to do, military and college. But I understand that they have either waived or suspended the SAT, ACT. Correct. But have they suspended or waived or reduced the, the, the GPA for getting the Hope Scholarship? As you no, know. that has not changed. That still. That has not changed. And what colleges are now doing is they're recognizing that because students are coming out of the coronavirus stage, if you will, that students may need more support in order to stay in school. And so I would ask parents to make sure they stay on top of that. Make sure that your, their child is assessed in the beginning of the year and receives the extra study support they may need. In K-12, we're doing it. We just need to make sure the colleges follow up on that as well. Now, the, the GPA coming out of high school for the HOPE is the 3.0? 3.0. But to get into any of these universities, a child can have as low as a 2.5, uh, uh, and still get into University of Georgia, Georgia State, Fort Valley State, Albany State. So this is an interesting point, great question. Uh, I was meeting with some co uh, college presidents uh, about a year ago, and I learned that any student who graduates can get into a school. They have it in tiers, and so and they have divided this up into areas. So if we have students and they qualify, they can go to University of Georgia. If they don't qualify for University of Georgia or what they call Tier 1 University, they can go then to something like Middle Georgia. If they can't get into Middle Georgia, then we can talk to Gordon State. Mm. If they can't get into Gordon State, then we can talk to Central Georgia Technical okay. College. There is a place for everybody if they come to school and if they graduate. What happens is we have put so many students on this track that you you got to go to this school that they fail to realize these other schools are just as good. Well, I went to Albany State and got my master's. There are good schools there. You just need to find the one that meets your needs now. My son, and I guess I need to be specific, my um, second son had a good friend who went to high school, graduated, went to Gordon State College for two years, then transferred to the University of Georgia, and that uh, student graduated at the same time my son did, who went to UGA for four years, and guess what? They got the same job, making about the same amount of money. Well, you just need to get to school and go. Yeah. My concern, and then here again, I don't expect you to have a comment on this one way or the other because this is a very political. My concern with the Hope Scholarship is that the University of Georgia would take a kid with a 2.4, 2.5 if he or she can play basketball 
uh, play. Uh, uh, and we just had a national championship. Most of those kids on that national championship team would not have qualified for Hope. I've done my research. Most of them would not. But they qualified to for another scholarship. I just don't. I think that's not fair. But anyway, that's uh, that, that's right. out of I'm your yeah. <laughs> that, as I say, stay in your lane. That's out of your lane. But something is in your lane, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Jones, is that we are in the midst of uh, African history, uh, with what we used to call it, uh, Black History Month, uh, African American Color History. But now we're in Black History Month. And we know that there's been a lot of discussion. And, I, and let me congratulate you. You're not the first black man to hold this position, but you're the first black man, to, person to hold this position to become superintendent of the entire year. And that's a quite an accomplishment. Don't want to let that go on. on, on but, uh, but the CRT we hear, the buzzwords, you were talking about the politics, and that this has become so political. We're talking about teaching history. And uh, what's your interpretation of CRT, and what's the big fuss about telling the truth? So, first of all, uh, the response that we have, which you will hear across... Critical race theory, critical that's race what theory. What you'll hear is that critical race theory is not a part of the curriculum in K-12 schools. The Georgia curriculum is made up of the Georgia standard. It comes from the Georgia Department of Education, and that's what we teach. And therefore, the textbooks we buy are also aligned with those standards. I believe what's happened, though, is with critical race theory, individuals who found something that they didn't like about school and tied it to race have now said that is critical race theory. Most of the people who I've heard complain about it haven't really studied it. They know what they heard on TV, but they have not really looked at what is the theory and why is it a problem. The idea is that Critical race theory is saying that basically where we are has been affected by race at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And there is truth in that. I mean, you just look at our history. But what they're saying is they don't want students to feel bad about themselves. Don't blame my child for something that happened 100 years ago. I hear that. That's not what happens. But what we do need to do is have students learn to use judgment, to be able to analyze facts, to be able to make arguments, and to be able to see both sides of an argument. If we can't get them to see both sides of an argument, they will never be able to figure out why Democrats believe one thing and Republicans believe another. Why old people think one way about health care, young people think about it in a different way. We need for students to be able to think, and they need to be able to see it. And one of the best ways is by helping them, the students that is, develop empathy. They have to be able to walk in someone else's shoes, and our teachers now know how to do that without making it political. But I think politics has just taken over, and people are now just saying, I don't want my child to learn about this, I don't want them to do that, and, and in some cases they have gone way overboard in trying to um, protect their child from something that they don't want them to know. Um, I'll give you one example that I thought was bad. President Obama, when he was in office, wanted to talk to all the students about the importance of school. And politicians got involved and said, you can't show that address that the president's going to make uh, inside schools. That's not something we want you to do. He was the president of the United States. He was talking about education. It ended up being a good speech. But there were some people who believed that was going to be indoctrination of students and it would affect them and other students in positive or negative ways. I don't know which way they did. I just wish that we could get back to the days where education is not political. Mm -hmm. I think you're good when you have people who run for the school board who are not aligned with the party, but it's a nonpartisan race, and they're in there for all students. That's the best way to make sure your community is going to take advantage of public education. Yeah. I'll say one thing about this, and I'll move on. Because it seems to me like state politicians, anyway, at the state level, on the one hand, they say local control is what we want, but when it comes to something that they, that they don't agree with, then they want to take local control away as to, as the superintendent, that you don't have the judgment, the right judgment. Here's a man, a West Point graduate, a, a, a doctor, and then all this experience, that, that they, we have to trust your judgment, that you wouldn't be teaching kids something that wouldn't allow anything in the, in the curriculum that would harm any child, be he black or white or she black or white. It wouldn't matter. Well, just as people would say, 
that Washington does not know what's best for Atlanta, I think they can say Atlanta doesn't know what's best for Macon. And therefore, local control is always better because the people who can hold me accountable are my eight school board members because they know what the people who elected them are saying and what they support. Um, it is hard to do one size fits all at the state level. Here's the latest example of that. Um, our governor has been very good in with supporting two superintendents. I'm on one of his advisories, and, uh, and he listens to us and has been very supportive. But recently he's said that he's going to introduce a bill saying that uh, parents will have the option of seeing if their child will wear a mask in school or not. Think about it. From his perspective, as the governor of the state where the majority of Georgia citizens are white, I can see that. The white experience through COVID has been different than the black experience through COVID. More than three out of four of my students are black. They don't have that experience of the majority of Georgia. They have a different experience, and I need to be able to respond to that. One size doesn't fit all. Are we at a point where it's now time to start changing uh, if masks are going to be required all day? We're getting there. The numbers are starting to come down, but they're not there yet. I would have preferred for politics not to be involved. But you know what? The elections are coming. Yeah, it's an election it, year. It, it, that's what it yeah. is, so we'll yeah. deal with it. We're talking with uh, Dr. Curtis Jones, who is the superintendent of the Bibb County School System, who's announced his retirement in June of this year, so he can speak freely about any, not that he didn't speak freely before, but I understand politics. Sometimes you have to be a little reserved. But he's speaking freely, as he said, as he prepared to exit as a senior last graduating class, and I guess we'll yeah. be moving on. But speaking of, uh, uh, I heard you speaking of race, and the amount and and and, um, and and the percentage of African American students in the Bibb County school system. Mm -hmm. We know that there are a lot of private schools. We know why they're here. Now, maybe people don't want to hear that. I know why they're here. My next guest, uh, that's going to be all next week, talking about Black history, knows why they're here because we grew up here and we knew when the school system was segregated, and we know when it became all these private schools came into being after we were forced uh, uh, integration, if you will. But now we have something. I heard you speak some years ago about charter schools. One you denied. One you said perhaps you should have, uh, uh, which is the ACE Academy. Not that you should have denied it, but you should have something you said you regret not having done as it relates to ACE Academy. Uh, and whether it was not making sure that it's located in a central location where all children, this, 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 this 70% that you speak of, African Americans in this community, would have equal access to that building as opposed to it being on the other side of the town, way away from their community, but no transportation to get them there. So um, we as a local school board can't determine where a charter school yes. was set up or where they'll be located. That is what they come up with, and if they don't really like what the local board wants, they can always become a state charter. Um, I don't really remember what the conversation was that we had before. The problem with um, the one school that we ended up having to close is that there were just issues with quality yeah. of instruction. ACE has done a good job with the population that it has and what they're doing. I, I do wish that it had stayed a part of the school system and worked with us. That's but what you, yeah. the problem that I see is that they just had a different vision, a different agenda and uh, the two didn't align anymore. So yeah. that's where they are. Um, Dr. Jones, we have heard a lot about, and we, and, you know, the crime in this city, and we hear that it goes back to education, the pipeline from school to jail as opposed from school to another school or school to work. How are we in this community? I, I know the stats. I look at them. I know the demographics. But what, what's driving, uh, uh, and how are we going to fix this? We know that the African-American male, you said before, was achieving less than in the school on the test and graduation rate lower than his female counterpart, uh, cohort. How do we fix that? I believe the way we're going to fix that problem, not only here in Macon, Bibb, but in the But where we are, we are focused on this one. The way we're going to fix it, though, is by having the community work with young people to see what the right thing is to do. 
It's all about character, and it's all about judgment. When people talk about the school-to-prison pipeline, in many cases, it's because the school rules started being broken. You can't come to school and bring a gun. You just can't do that. And we're not going to let that occur. If you do that, you need to be prepared to deal with the consequences. You can't come to school and say, this kid said something ugly to me, and then just start fighting, and not think there's going to be a consequence. And yet I have too many parents who will say, if he hits you, you hit him back. Oh. You need to work with the school and work with the teacher. My belief is some parents have just forgotten that we're on the same side. We all want the students to do well. We want them to graduate. We want them to be able to excel. And in some cases, they will say to me, i got to defend my child. That teacher is not here for my child. I don't have a single teacher who's not here for the children in their classroom. If I had one and they weren't, i get rid of them. That's what, I mean, they need to be here for that person. We're all on the same team. And so I think it's helping the young students learn that it's about character, it's about doing what's right and doing your best to pretty much follow the golden rule. Do unto others, you have them do unto you, and you're going to be fine. So parents got to be involved parents in this thing more. Involved. Gotta be more they have involved. to be. Now, uh, but, 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 but getting back to, you know, this thing bothers me, you know, as a, a, a father of a black male that I had to, I, I, had, I know what I had to do to get him through school. I couldn't just sit on the sideline. I had to be actively involved on a daily basis, and he didn't have nearly the challenges that some children have in cumbersome households. He had Wi-Fi, he had a computer, laptop, phone, everything else. So I can imagine what a single parent with two or three children and a teenage boy, you know, uh, off the chain, if you will, uh, going through. So they need help. And we, uh, so you're saying the school system has to understand that and provide that help or the, the community at large? I think the school system has to help provide it. And I'll be honest with you, one of the best things we have to help is the Leader in Me program. That program, in essence, yeah, teaches, me about that. teaches students that deferred gratification is better than instant gratification. Think about that. Instant gratification tells you to steal something. Instant gratification because you want it now. Instant gratification tells you to touch somebody when you shouldn't do it because it's not appropriate. Deferred gratification says, I'm not going to have this now, but I'm willing to wait. I'm going to do my work now so I can graduate later. That has been an issue because the uh, response of I need to defend myself or take care of myself has in some cases been more than the other. I do believe the school can help. But again, I need parents to help us with that. We currently have Leader in Me in all of our schools. And it teaches students about this private victory. You need to be able to put first things first. You need to be able to begin with the end in mind. You need to think about win-win. I'm not going to get over on you and make you lose. We're going to find something that's going to work for both of us. Or we're not going to do it at all. That works. And it works not only in school, but it also works in life. Um, I'll be honest. If anything's helped me in my success, that has been, has been that attitude. We have to recognize that most people are not here to get over on us. Now, you can't be stupid, <laughs> but you got to recognize that in some cases, give the other person the benefit of the doubt until they prove they don't deserve it anymore. Well, that would be the gratification. That's good. I, you know, and that about character, you know, do what's right when no one is looking, just as you will when someone is looking. You get us a teenage pregnancy. Wait till you get married. Yeah. Instant gratification says don't do that. Well, I know that you uh, are proud of your accomplishments. You've taken us to high heights, no question. But what's one thing that you weren't able to do? The, the graduate, you, the, the black male not graduating, uh, not achieving at the level that you know that he is capable of achieving. What's your biggest thing that you were not able to get done so, during your So let me give it to you this way. And this is a black fact that some people may not know. Um, when I arrive, the, I, and I like to compare apples to apples. I like to compare black students in Macon Bibb to black students in the state of Georgia. And the black students in Bibb County were performing below their state counterparts. In three of the last four years, black students have graduated at a rate equal to black students anywhere else in the state. In fact, this past year, the class of 2021, 
black students in Bia graduated with a graduation rate of 81.7 versus 81.5 for their counterparts in the rest of the state. I'm very proud of that because truthfully, with black students being three out of four of our students, that means that we're educating our kids as well as anybody else in the state of Georgia when you compare apples to apples. What am I not satisfied with? Our overall graduation rate is not higher than the state rate. Overall, we got over 80 for the first per first time, but the state average is 83. So we're trailing the state overall. And primarily, that's because the white students are not graduating at the same rate as white students in the rest of the state. We're going to have to figure out how to help them graduate at a higher rate. Now, of those graduates, uh, you know, it's one thing to have a diploma. It's one thing to have a diploma that's worth something that you right. can go to get a job, uh, go to college, and do whatever you go to in the military. So of those 80%, you, if they got a diploma, you're pretty confident that they were able to go and make a life for themselves. So today, earlier this morning, my first meeting was with the thing called the BEP, Business Education Partnership. And we were able to share with those people on that call, it was about 50 people, that uh, our three E initiative is working. We want students when they graduate to be able to be either enrolled in college, enlisted in the military, or employed. That's three E's. For the class of 2021, more than 60% of them were enrolled in one of those areas. Employed, enlisted, or enrolled. We had another group on graduation day, and that's when we took the survey, that weren't sure of where they were going to go. But if you can get employed, if you can get in the military, or if you can get enrolled, yeah, that diploma means something. And so our goal is to get that 3E initiative up to 100%. So when students walk across the stage, they're in one of those three E's. Hmm. Great. Well, we know that a lot of that, that, that's good, the three E's, that, 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 that makes sense. Uh, we know that you've been, a lot of money has been dumped on, into the school system, the local governments, and so forth. Uh, will that money, even though you're leaving, you won't have spent all that money? Do we have a road map as to how that money should and be spent to enhance the, this 80%, uh, getting it to 90 or 100%. I appreciate that. So we had to put forth a plan that was a three-year plan for how the monies would be spent. We're now in the first year of that, and we're pretty much on track with where we thought we would be. The school board approved the plan. They get briefed every month on our finances, and I think they will be the ones to make sure that the monies are spent appropriately. And then when it needs to be modified a little bit, they would be the ones to help us approve the adjustments that we make. Well, the person that follows you will have some big shoes to follow, to fill, uh, no question about it. Do you have a candidate or candidates that you have recommended? Or if you would, you probably wouldn't tell me. <laughs> but, uh, I will tell you that the school board is um, hard and heavy into the process. They have advertised the position. Applicants have applied. The board at some point in the future will evaluate those and decide who they want to interview. So they're on track, I do believe, for having uh, the next superintendent identified well before the end of the school year. Okay. And so, uh, but you will have input, I'm sure. I'm sure I they will ask your opinion. I will tell them my opinion, uh, yes. but I'm it's, confident they will do what they want to do. Yeah, and your opinion will always be confidential, I'm sure. But uh, uh, what, uh, we got about a minute left, less than a minute. What, what, what's next for you? Uh, not moving to Florida and sitting on the bench, uh, on the beach where you have too much energy and you're too young? What, what's next for you? Well, I've had some ask me if I do some consulting, and I'm looking forward to doing that. And uh, so there will be some of that on the state level as well as on the national level. And I'm also looking forward, as I should, said earlier, with developing closer relationships with family and friends. And uh, that's always important. Jobs are always hard, yeah. like ours, to keep friends. So I'm yeah. going to work hard in improving that area. Well, thank you. We've been speaking with Dr. Curtis Jones, who is a superintendent of schools, and former superintendent, now superintendent of the year 2019, I think. And he's done great wonders here with for us during his tenure of what, five years. Seven. Seven. Oh, time goes fast. Seven years. And we wish you all the best. And we hate to see you go, but we, we're glad for it that, that you're going to be able to spend more time with your family and come see about us every thank now you, and then. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. And we thank you all so much for joining us this week here on the Mill Georgia Spotlight. Until next week, I'm your host, Jack Ellis. So long.